Hello folks, this is Tom from antidashproton.com and this is a really, really short video. Yeah, you're going to say, yeah, right, Tom, a short video. Well, you can already look and see how long it is down there in the corner. Uh, I wanted to cover five topics that I get asked really, really often in emails, and I figured I would just kind of like cover them quickly. Um, the five topics will be what count rate is safe, like how many counts per minute is bad or good or whatever. Uh, how do I, can I, should I test food? Um, Geiger counters, uh, can they detect isotopes, you know, like what's in something? Um, er, is everything actually radioactive? You hear that said sometimes. And is it true that no level is safe? Well, uh, those are the five little quick things I'm going to go over and you're saying, well, those aren't really quick topics. Well, I'll try to be quick. So I'm going to glaze over a few things. Let me start with the first thing. If you email me these questions, they're fine as long as you understand two things. A, I can't answer questions that are about safety. So you you know you hold up something and say, hey, I believe that this is safe or not safe. Should I drink it or eat it? You know what level is safe? I can't really answer those. I mean, you see lots of other people doing it. So if I did it, probably nothing bad would ever happen. And you and I and I can say what's safe within reason. Like for example, I can't tell you that taking let's say ibuprofen is safe compared to taking Tylenol, obviously I'm not a doctor. Whereas I could tell you, for example, that it is not safe to drink a gallon of gasoline, right? It's because that's so obvious. It's like reducto absurdum. It's so obvious that it's, you know, like I can tell you right now that if you exposed yourself for one hour to five uh, five grays of radiation, I guarantee you that you would, your, your chance of death would be like 90 something percent or higher. Okay, and I don't have to be a certified health physicist to tell you that. That's sort of like, oh my god, duh, your skin would probably peel off. But, but whereas if I, you ask me whether or not you could drink water that has some known cesium-137 in it, let's say 100 becquerels per kilogram or liter or whatever, I can't tell you that that's safe or unsafe because that's not reducto absurdum. That's all of a sudden sort of a normal thing that could happen. Now, <clears throat> let's get into these quick things, all right? So just make sure you understand that. I'm not a professional. I've, I say this like every single video. So by God, you can accuse me of whatever you want, but never accuse me of claiming I was a professional because I'm not a professional. Say it like a thousand times. All right, what count rate is safe, number one? Um, counts per minute, counts per second that are in your Geiger counter or your device or whatever, uh, they're not, they, they, they don't scale between units. Like one unit could have a background of 10 counts per minute. Another unit could have a background of 500,000 counts per minute. And they would both, and they, that would be their normal background. So what you want to look at is the change in the background. How much does it go up? So if I have a, a Geiger counter that is 100 uh, count per minute background, and it goes up to 1,000, it's gone up tenfold, 10 times. If I have one that's got a background of 10, and it goes up to from 10 to 110, that's 11 times increase. And that 11 times increase is actually greater proportionally than the other one, even though the numbers are higher. And now, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, uh, Geiger counters are not really meant for that purpose. They're meant to look for change, not just the gross number. So I can't tell you 100 is safe. Or, well, first of all, I couldn't tell you any. Even if I knew it, even if I even if I actually knew the answer, I couldn't tell you because I can't tell you. But I don't know the answer. And for that matter, if you went to a certified health physicist and somebody who actually can legally say what's safe, they couldn't tell you either. And the reason they couldn't tell you is because they would say, okay, well, that depends. What what unit are you using and what isotope is it and what are the conditions? Lots of, it's very complicated. So when you see these people on the internet that hold up something and put the Geiger counter over it and say, it's 100 counts per minute. This is not safe, not at all. Well, they may be right. They may not be right. And there's no way that they could have any earthly clue whether they're right or not. For, the, for that matter, without a lot more extra information to go along with it, even somebody who has the actual degrees couldn't tell them. That's why I always get a kick out of people that do that on the internet. I've tested this food and it's not safe. Yeah, how the hell do you know? You don't have any degrees in it, neither do I, so shut up. Anyway, so moving right along, how do I test food? That kind of moves along with uh, that kind of goes with uh, number one. How do you test food? Well, you can, they, when, when I say a guy counter can, can test food for radiation, let me qualify that statement. It's very, very important. After a nuclear war, okay, or, or after something's gone wrong, let's say you're living in a town and a truck drives by nuclear waste and it gets hit by a train and it goes everywhere or a dirty bomb goes off or your rea local reactor melts down, something is going to blanket the area in a large amount of radiation. I'm talking like in Fukushima. Remember when they had the people in the street and they were testing them with the Geiger counters, you know, and people were getting higher readings? In those cases, a Geiger counter, when there's no other better method, is perfectly usable. I'd rather have one than nothing. Okay, fine, Geiger counters cannot detect minor, tiny little bits of radiation which may be unsafe. 
but by god even the crappiest geiger counter is better than nothing because you could hold it up to your food and test it and this food ticks a bunch and this food over here doesn't well if you have nothing else to eat and this emergency services aren't to you then at least you know that this that this will figure out which one's safe <laughs> this one's safer than this one you don't know how safe either of them are but you know that this one whichever one i said was lower than the other one you get the idea so problems i'm seeing inverse of myself on the screen here and i'm confusing the hell out of myself so basically a geiger counter is useful for that but a geiger counter is not that, that's for an emergency okay that's an emergency all right that's like testing the water to see whether or not it's going to kill you to drink it you know it's not going to kill you to drink it but you shouldn't be drinking it like that every day it's a, that sort of thing it's not to be used when you're determining whether or not your food that you bought at the store is safe because it can't do that i mean it, it yes fine i've had discussions with people about this it could theoretically do it but by God, the amount of work you'd have to go through. You see all those goofy people on the internet with the little lead testing caves that they make and everything? That doesn't really work very well with Geiger counters. And I can go into detail if somebody wants to actually know why. I can even experimentally show you why it doesn't work very well. It's hard as hell to do even with my really expensive software and equipment. I mean, it's just tough. Food safety is a pain in the butt. You can go to Polymaster and buy, I think it's a 1403 or something. I'll show a link to it. But uh, uh, that's actually a food tester that can test, uh, according to them, down to 25 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-137. Um, I'm waiting for information back from Polymaster on that because I want to know how they came about those numbers before I trust that. But, so can you test food with a Geiger counter? Yeah, absolutely, but you got to understand, what are you testing? Are you testing after an emergency happens and you want to keep your family as safe as you reasonably can until the emergency services show up and more stable food is brought in that has been you know officially certified by better means yeah it's great it's what you should have um but should you after that's happened and after everything's calmed down and, and people are measuring uh, stuff and telling you what isn't isn't safe should you be using it then probably not because consider this if the government were lying to you and let's say that they said that this is the safe amount but they actually allowed let's say four times that amount to come in and just didn't test for it, you still wouldn't be able to pick it up with a Geiger counter. It could already be over the limit and be dangerous, according to them. And you still wouldn't be able to detect it, so there's no point. So keep it for emergencies, nothing else. God, I can't express that one enough. Um, uh, well, I can't uh, stress that one enough. Number three, almost out of time here, almost out of, I'm trying to keep this under 10 minutes, almost out of time here. Number three out of five, Geiger counters can detect iso isotopes. No, no they can't, oh my God. They detect the isotopes, but they detect all isotopes equally. So low energy photon, click. High energy photon, click. Any energy photon, click. So one de nuclear detection equals one pulse equals one uh, doodle of the little, you know, the dial or one tick of the digital display. And it doesn't matter what energy that is high energy, low energy, and if you can't determine energy, you cannot determine isotopes. Yes, you can do this little decay curve analysis. I'm doing one right now for another video. I'm going to ironically post a video, hopefully tonight, where I show a decay curve. <laughs> How's that for funny? But even my decay curve in there can't tell you what the isotope is, all right? Now I already know what the isotope is, so that, that's, that, that takes care of that. But, but if you don't know, you can be this close. Like if you take uh, some radioactive uh, water off of your car and you, and you find that it's curving in a couple hours, yeah, fine. You can say that that's pretty reasonable. Uh, you can pretty reasonably believe that that's probably a radon washout. And it probably is a radon washout for the most part, but there could be some cesium-137 in there, and you couldn't prove that it is in there. Or you're not supposed to prove something isn't in there, of course, obviously, but to make it simple, to prove it's not in there, you couldn't do, prove it either way. Because its decay curve requires 30 to 60 years to see a trend, you know what I mean? That's not really very good for decay curves. So the answer is no. You can use it to sometimes suggest, you can de determine if it's alpha, beta, or gamma, you can determine it sometimes, you can help confirm it if you have other suspicions and other information, but by God, you cannot just cold out determine an isotope with a Geiger counter. No! And anybody who thinks that you can, you go to a university with a real PhD scientist, and you have one of them send you back a letter that states that you can, and their name on it, and you post that, and I'd like to see it. Go right ahead. And by the way, as soon as they do that, they'll be ridiculed by all the other scientists, which would be funny. All right, number four, everything is radioactive. No, that's not true. Everything is not radioactive. Radioactive things are radioactive. Um, everything you and I normally see, there's lots of different particles, but everything you and I normally bump into is made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. There are other things. Hell, I own something that produces positrons. But the point of the matter is everything you and I see normally is made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, all right? 
um, technically particles like this can decay. For example, a neutron, or sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, a neutron caught out in the open by itself, caught in the wild, only makes it like, what is it, 10, 14 minutes, something like that, and then it decays. That's its half-life, I guess. So technically, I think it makes it longer than that. But the point of the matter is maybe its half-life is shorter. It's not very long, is what I'm trying to say. Bound inside of a nucleus, though, where all the protons and neutrons live inside the atoms, it lasts a lot longer. So, um, these particles can decay, like a uh, proton decay is supposed to take something like 10 to the 33 years for it to occur, which is like the length of the universe or something to that effect for its half-life. So if you wanted to be absolutely the most incredibly, ridiculously hardcore about it that could possibly be, fine, everything's radioactive in so much as everything has a non-zero probability of decay and by the way by the way non-zero doesn't mean very high all right what's the probability of you winning the lottery 20 times in a row it's not zero but it isn't too high so in that regard everything is in theory radioactive but the reality is is that when we talk about radioactive radioactive we're talking about things that are abundantly radioactive things that actually emit radiation reasonably true like Bismuth, you know the pink the pink stuff you drink when you're sick that contains bismuth, regular stable bismuth. It was recently proven in a paper, a scientific paper, that bismuth, even stable bismuth, like what's in the pink stuff, is actually in theory radioactive. Now, one bottle of pink stuff might decay one single alpha particle in like a hundred thousand years or something. I mean, it's theoretically radioactive. And that's pushing it, okay? When you talk about radioactive, what we're talking about is you hold the Geiger counter up and it ticks, okay? In that regard, only things that are unstable are radioactive. So cesium-135, I think, is cesium-135, is it stable? But one of the cesiums, like 133 or 135, one of the two of them is, is perfectly stable, but 134 and 137, for example, are not stable. Some are stable, some are not. That's just how that is. No, not everything is stable. For example, a proton can decay in theory to an electron, a, po a positive electron, so a positron, and a, um, a pion, and the pion can actually decay over time to a uh, gamma, I think. Yeah, maybe it's two gammas. But anyway, whatever. So, last but not least, no level is safe. Nothing. All right, let me put it to you like this. If you had a gallon of water, a big gallon of water, it's like a couple liters of water if you're from those random European countries. Yeah. I've been ragging on European stuff all this week. I'm sorry, European people. I love Europe, which isn't a country, but a collection of a bunch of countries. You know, the average American probably doesn't know that. I bet you right now, if I went outside and got 100 Americans, United States of America, not even Canada, I'm talking about the United States, if I got 100 of them and I asked them if Europe was a country or a bunch of countries, I bet you... And this is sad, more than one of them would probably think it was one country. I bet you, I bet you, I bet you like 20 of them. It's hideous. Of course it's a bunch of countries. But anyway, you wouldn't believe. Anyhow, so uh, Europeans in general, they like the leaders and the me metric stuff and le système de, de international and all that crap. So, uh, you know, a couple, like a gallon's a couple liters. If you had one of those and it had 100 cesium-137 atoms in it, would that make it dangerous? They would decay pretty quickly. I don't think... Hmm, if I say it's dangerous or not, have I violated my first rule? Well, let's only talk about me. How's that? I'm only talking about me. I would drink it. Why? Because I happen to know for a fact that one of the ways that they're able to tell how old wine is is by... Focus is by taking wine bottles and testing to see how much cesium-137 is in them. Why? Because cesium-137 is in wine after the nuclear testing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s started. If it's, depending on the levels, you can determine, like, kind of when the bottle was around and whatnot. I mean, I'm telling you, cesium-137 is in every damn thing. If you have a sufficiently sensitive equipment, you can detect it in just about all water. So, right off the bat, I don't even know how, other than using laboratory equipment, you could get yourself to having zero, okay? What, what it boils down to is how much can be proven to be linked to something bad. Now, me, zero is what I'd go for, but it ain't going to happen. So the answer is, uh, uh, there's, it's not really true that no level is safe. Uh, as, as you approach zero, risk goes down to zero. We know that to be true. That's not my statement. That's straight out of the BI 
uh, BIER 7 phase 2 report. You can see it yourself. It's called linear non-threshold model. I can tell you that that relation exists. I can't tell you what point that relation, you know, has like a Y or a X intercept. I am not allowed to make specific points on the grid, but I can tell you that that relationship does exist. That's kind of a duh principle. The more beers you drink, the less safe it becomes to drink the beers. So the answer is, is there is in theory no level, no level safe because in theory all levels contain some minute amount of risk. But there's a point at which the uh, risk of a glass of water is like 1 in 10 million or something like that, and it starts to get to the point where it becomes just kind of absurd to even worry about it. I'm not sure what that level is, and I'm not trying to minimize it or say that, that oh, it's okay to have some. No, it's not. You, the government and everybody else should strive to remove as much radioactive material from their food as conceivably possible. And if I had a child, I wouldn't want them eat it, drinking water that was, let's say, 100 becquerels per liter. I wouldn't be happy about that. That's me and my child. I don't have a child. But if I did, I wouldn't want that. So I totally understand. But I also understand that you can't get it out of there. It's always been there, some of it. Not cesium-137, of course, but things like uranium. So you have to kind of be realistic, too. Life in itself is nothing more than one giant chance, and then we die. So... We need to try as best as we can to live as well as we can, but we can't go for absurdities. Because imagine all the, the amount of the amount of money it takes to get most of it out, the amount of money it takes to get nearly all of it out. If we got most of it out, and then took the rest of that money and used it to get all the other crap out, like pesticides and pharmaceuticals that are also killing us, imagine how much better we would do. Radiation isn't the only thing that hurts you. It's not safe. But by God, it's not the only thing that hurts you out there. I'm really, quite frankly, upset about pesticides, but that's me. Uh, yeah. I went over uh, I went over 10 minutes by a little bit because I'm long-witted, so bye.